Well, yesterday with Peter, we were looking at him as he used the elements of his conversion to share the gospel message in the Acts of the Apostles, to go and use those keys of the kingdom to unlock the door to the Jews and to the Gentiles. And we noted how one of the big lessons for us is that God will create the opportunities, but he expects us to use those opportunities and to preach, to unloose others by giving them the knowledge of the kingdom and the things concerning the name of Jesus Christ, that they might be loosed from their sins, that God can forgive them based on that understanding of repentance and a baptism. Well, this morning what we hope to do is to take a look at what Peter took away from it all. Sometimes in Scripture we look at an individual and we wonder, well, where did they end up? How did they take everything in? How did they process it? Where did they end up at the end of their lives? We don't have to wonder with Peter. Because by God's grace, we have First and Second Peter, written 30 years after his ministry with the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's almost as though we get to ask Peter this very question. Peter, what did you take away from all your time with the Lord and from your work in the early ecclesia? Doesn't that create an eager want to really understand what it is that Peter is saying to us in these epistles? We'll only have an opportunity to take a look at the first epistle, and it was really a great lead-in by our brother Stephen to start talking about 1 Peter, because that's what we'll be spending our time looking at this morning. And we'd like to look at three aspects concerning 1 Peter, to remind ourselves of the background of the epistle, what its purpose was, who it was written to, when it was written, and why it was written. And second, to take a look at Peter's realization concerning trial, what it is that he learned from trial in his own life and then to reflect on Peter's exhortation to us as it pertains to shepherding. As Peter, one of the shepherds of the flock, reflects on his own learning in 1 Peter chapter 5 and shares with us the things that we might learn to help us in our shepherding in the ecclesia. Well, Peter's first epistle is believed to have been written around A.D. 60 or A.D. 61. And it was written to the believers who were scattered throughout the Roman Empire. And as I've already mentioned, this would have been about 30 years after his ministry with the Lord Jesus Christ. But this was written to a group that had not personally seen Jesus. Sometimes we can take for granted that all of those who are in the New Testament had seen Jesus and had personally witnessed what he had done. But that doesn't seem to be the case with this group. Because Peter says early on in 1 Peter 1 and verse 8, whom having not seen... And he's talking about the fact that they hadn't seen Jesus. So they were in a similar position to us of needing to rely on the account of others, whether spoken or written, others who had seen Jesus, who had witnessed those things. Peter was nearing the end of his life, but he saw trouble looming on the horizon for the early ecclesia. Because six years earlier, Nero had become Caesar. And in just a few years, intense persecution would begin of the early ecclesia. Given in his book, The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, talks about Nero as being profligate or wasteful and cruel. And Nero would direct his cruelty at the early ecclesia very soon, as he would set Rome ablaze, blame the Christians for it, and then intensely persecute them and attempt to destroy them. Just imagine the trial that this would have presented to the early Christians of where they, through no trial or no, no problem of their own, nothing that they had done wrong, they would now be enduring this intense persecution at the hands of the Romans. And so the big challenge that's presented to Peter is how do I prepare these brethren to endure this persecution to the end and not to walk away from their faith? Isn't it interesting how Peter finds himself in almost the exact position that his Lord was in on the night of his betrayal, of where he's trying to prepare Peter to have the faith to push through, that his faith fail not. And now Peter's reflecting on all the things that he had learned from his Lord to try to do that for his brethren, that now that he's been converted, he's trying to strengthen his brethren. Well, Peter addresses the issue head on. He doesn't attempt to minimize what it is that they're facing, 
But we can see the repetition of trial and temptation and difficulty coming up over and over again in this epistle. Even though there will be manifold temptations, a fiery trial, sufferings, more than ten times he mentions it, at the mouth of a roaring lion, he t attempts to remind them that the duration would be just for a little while. And that in contrast to this little while that they would be suffering, that the promise that they had was everlasting that the promise that they had would endure forever. The glory that they awaited would be eternal. In anticipation of the challenge that it would be for the believers to really accept this, that in the face of intense persecution, to be able to look beyond it, Peter tries to refocus their minds on the glory that awaited. In fact, 18 times we see glory or glorified come up to try to refocus their minds. And you can think about a camera. We've seen many of these this week. Many cameras throughout the week and how you have on some cameras the ability to change the focus of the lens, to change the point of focus. Oftentimes what happens is we tend to focus on the object that's closest to us. But Peter is attempting to move to the side somewhat and to change the point of focus to what lay beyond. It's similar to this type of a photograph of where you can see an image in the foreground that naturally you would focus on and the background is fuzzy. But Peter is trying to get them to refocus on what lay beyond. That though the trial was right in front of their face, they needed to focus past the trial to be able to see what the trial was attempting to produce in them. No, it wouldn't make the trial go away. But the trial wouldn't be the focus. The kingdom would be the focus. And so he reminds them of the purpose of this trial, of what it was working toward. Not only their glory, but working toward life. <laughs> Think about the contrast that this presents to them. A contrast that though they were staring death in the face, this letter is full of words concerning life. Their death at the hands of the Romans was not the end. It was a step toward the end. The end for them would be eternal life through Jesus Christ their Lord. And so he talks about a living hope. He talks about being resurrected and their eternal salvation at least 20 times. And so seeing trial as a part of the process and not the end of the process would allow them to be able to press through and to endure. It took Peter a long time to come to this realization in his life that trial was a part of the process, that the cross would come before the crown. But time is not on their side. Time is running out. And Peter needs to accelerate their learning in this regard to help them come to this realization so that they're able to do this. The natural thing for each of us is to, what's fo to focus on what's closest to us, isn't it? That when a trial is right in front of our face, it's difficult to focus on anything beyond that. Peter is trying to give the believers then and the believers now, us, the tools to be able to refocus our minds on what lay beyond. And one of the things that he does to do this is to talk about the duration of these things. How long they would last. Because when you take a look at the duration, he says, what you're suffering now is for a season. It's for a little while. But what you're going to enjoy in the future is everlasting. To continue to remind them of those things that lay beyond. And the everlasting nature of those things compared to the fleeting things that we face in this present age. This brings us to our second point of consideration, which is Peter's realization concerning trial. Peter in his early life failed to accept that the cross must come before the crown. Remember when he withstood Jesus to his face and said, Lord, you're wrong. You don't need to die in Matthew chapter 16. Pity yourself. These things are not going to happen to you. But Peter tells us that he wasn't alone in this regard. In the difficulty that he had to come to this realization. But he says in 1 Peter 1 verses 10 to 12 that even the prophets struggled to understand this. That even the prophets who spoke of the Lord Jesus Christ didn't fully understand the sufferings that would come. And how those sufferings would result in the glorification of Jesus Christ. He says instead that those things in verse 12 were written for us. For our learnings. The people that would come after to be able to look back and to see if that's how it worked for Jesus. 
and we've been called upon to follow Jesus, then that's how it will work for us as well. And what's amazing to consider is he says that even the angels desired to look into these things. Even the angels were not given a complete understanding until it happened of how all these things would work toward the glorification of Jesus. It's amazing to think about the gravity of that. Suffering in this life is a necessary element on the pathway to the kingdom. And I put an asterisk next to that verse, to verse 11, because it's such a key element of this epistle. It's one that Peter struggled with so much early on in his life to come to this realization that sufferings come first and glorification must follow after. But what exactly does this mean? Does this mean, as some have proposed, that if suffering is a necessary part of the process, that we should pursue suffering so that we can associate with Christ? I don't think that's the case at all. But what Peter's telling us is if we're pursuing Christ, then God will make sure that the right events come into our lives to shape and to mold us, that those things will be for our benefit, for our growth. But sometimes we think about suffering in the context of the apostles, and we think about the big things that they endured. We read in Corinthians about what Paul went through, about how he was beaten, shipwrecked, how he suffered stoning. And we think, well, we don't face that kind of persecution in our day. And we think about Christ and we think about the ultimate suffering that he went through on the cross. But what about the work of Christ each and every day and the suffering that he went through, the trial that he endured? Because isn't it the fact that he lived a perfect life that made his death meaningful, that made the death on the cross have significance? was that it was a man who lived perfectly through the strength of his heavenly Father. Those things are very important for us to think about, that as Jesus endured ridicule, rejection by others, even his own family, that he continued to press forward in the confidence that he had. Each of us have trials that we face every single day. Some of those trials are more apparent than others, but the mere presence of the trial and the identification of it as a trial are not sufficient, is what Peter's telling us. Instead, what Peter goes on to say is you have to embrace trial in your life. And you think, well, embrace trial, that seems to be a bit strong, right? I mean, how are we to embrace trial? But look at the attitude that Peter talks about of what we need to have during trial. He brings this up repeatedly as well, at least nine times, talking about the attitude that we need to have one of joy resulting in praise. How exactly do we do that? How do we have joy in trial? Even Hebrews in chapter 12 says, No trial for the present is joyous but grievous. If you continue reading on though, he says, But afterward, afterward it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who are exercised thereby. Peter's saying, Refocus your mind on what lay beyond. And that will allow you to not just endure trial, but to rejoice in the fact that God is working in our lives. And so what Peter is trying to do is to strengthen them in the purpose of trial, the duration of the reward, and the attitude that they needed to have. But what's a practical way that we can try to recalibrate our minds to have the right attitude during trial? He says this a number of different times in the epistle of where he brings up a particular element and he says why you should have that attitude. He says in chapter 1, verses 6 through 9, greatly rejoice despite many temptations because your faith is being developed. Your faith is being developed. Our faith is being developed through those things. And beyond that, Christ did the same. It links us to our Lord. In chapter 2, verses 19 to 21, the attitude not only of joy, but of patience. Be patient if you're doing well and you're suffering for it. Because Christ did the same in chapter 2 and verse 21. He continues on in chapter 3 and verse 14. Be happy if you're suffering for righteousness' sake. Because Christ did the same in chapter 3 and verse 18. And in chapter 4, verses 11 to 14, rejoice even in the presence of intense trial, because 
you are then partakers in Christ's suffering, is what he says in chapter 4 and verse 13. He continues to connect what they're going through to the Lord Jesus Christ. And what we face are not just isolated trials, isolated incidents that we endure. What Peter is saying is that God is orchestrating those things to connect us to our Lord Jesus Christ. The connection is that we can rejoice in the fact that we are linked to our Lord. Because if we are suffering with Christ, then it enables us to be glorified with Him. Paul talks about this in 1 Corinthians 15 in regards to the resurrection, that Christ is the first fruits, and we who will come after. And so enduring trial with the right attitude actually links us to our Lord and sets us on the pathway to glorification. It's not a way to the kingdom. Peter is saying it is the only way to the kingdom. There is no other way. If we don't accept, if we don't embrace trials as God's mechanism to take us to the kingdom, then we will not grow. If we find ourselves resentful against God or harboring ill feelings about our circumstances, Peter's telling us it's going to be very, very difficult for us to grow. And instead, we'll find ourselves in the position that he found himself in in Matthew chapter 16. The thing that he references in 1 Peter 2 and verse 8, where he says, those who stumble at the word. Peter looks back and he says, right after Jesus told me that I was going to be the rock of the ecclesia, I became a rock of stumbling and a stone of offense. I got in the way of the Lord because I wasn't willing to accept this in my own life. Learn from me is what Peter says. Look at the humility of this man. We like to hide our faults, but Peter puts it right out there in the open and he says, learn from my mistakes. Don't fall into the same mistake that I went through of where I wasn't willing to accept God's will in my life. Learn from me is what he's telling them. Peter never forgot that moment of where his Lord told him to get thee behind me, Satan, for thou art an offense unto me because you savor the things that be of men more than those things that be of God. Peter said, don't do that. Learn from my mistakes. This was the key message that Peter was extracting from this incident. And from the three decades that were following, we must joyfully and willingly submit to God's way of developing us and be patient as he works with us to develop us for his kingdom. Peter repeats this message multiple times. Peter required repetition multiple times as we've seen. Why does he say it over and over again? Because it's such a difficult message to receive. Right, we can say this cognitively. We can sit here in class and we can nod our heads and say, yeah, I understand. This is God's mechanism for developing us. But what about when we leave this place? When we hit back to our lives on Monday morning? Are these things going to be a distant memory? Or are these things really going to impact what we do the next time trial comes along? Or even the trials that we're currently facing? How can we apply this mindset to be more purposeful in the way that we address the challenges. Well, what did Peter do? He vehemently proclaimed his loyalty to Christ pre-trial, but when trial hit him and he faced the heat of the moment, he just as vehemently denied his Lord and stood with those who were opposed to his Lord. I say this not to take a shot at Peter, but to show that if even a man as Peter can struggle with this, to make this recognition and then go to implement it and fail, we too can do the same thing. We have to remember. We have to think. And Peter instructs in his second epistle the need to remember. To remember, to remember is what he emphasizes over and over again because how quickly we forget. It's not just a theory. It's a way of life. Peter lived this. This is the way to salvation, is what he's laying out for us. And so with getting all the believers to this point in the letter, of walking them through how they needed to adjust their own thinking and their own mindset, what he does from this point is he steps back and he says, it's not just about individually getting the right mindset. We need to correct our mindset. But at the same time, we need to have the right environment in the ecclesia. We need to make sure that the environment in the ecclesia 
supports the growth of the individual members within that ecclesia. And for that, we're going to get to the third portion of what we've been talking about in 1 Peter chapter 5, of where we'll reflect on Peter's exhortations as he looks at his own shepherding and instructs us regarding ours. Peter concludes this epistle by talking about the intense trial that awaited them at the hands of the Romans. One of the biggest things that Peter is trying to do is to mentally prepare them for what lay ahead. This is one of the biggest challenges. And so he's trying to address the mindset, the attitude that they need to possess. And he goes on to talk about the need for a strong ecclesia. Look at how he addresses the ecclesia here. He says in chapter 5 and verse 1, The elders which are among you I exhort, who am also an elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. He says, I also am an elder. Think about the position of Peter, though. Look at the humility. He's not saying, well, I was with the Lord Jesus Christ, and he elevated me to this position. He says, I'm no different than any of you. I'm in the same position. I understand. I also am an elder. There's a term of equality here of where you can see that Peter is no longer lifting himself up above the rest of the brethren, but he's associating himself with them in the way that he addresses them. Well, Peter goes on to strengthen his brethren, knowing that this would be the only way to strengthen them, to realize his position as being no different than the rest. And he gives them the counsel concerning leadership in the ecclesia, what the requirements were for leadership, And isn't that where it starts, that everything rises and falls on leadership? And we can see this over and over again in the Bible. Well, he talks first about what strong leaders are supposed to do. And it's no coincidence that it aligns directly with what the Lord Jesus Christ told him in John 21. To feed my sheep, to feed my lambs, and also to tend and to lead the flock. He talks about the need to feed the flock of God in verse 2. That is the primary responsibility, is to feed the flock of God, to give them the spiritual nourishments that's needed to enable them to keep moving forward. And beyond that, he says, to provide the oversight. To provide the oversight means to proactively look to the needs of our brothers and sisters. And as the shepherd would stand there, he would look over the flock, Not just where the sheep were presently, but he would look for potential dangers that might come into the flock. Wolves in sheep's clothing that could enter in and destroy the flock, attacking the very fabric and integrity of the sheep themselves. This word is translated as looking diligently in Hebrews 12 and verse 15. There's a certain intensity that we need to have when we look out for each other, that we know what's going on in each other's lives not for the purpose of snooping around, but for the purpose of really being helpful and being constructive. These are the what elements of leadership in the ecclesia. And he goes on to address the how elements, how it is that they are supposed to lead, the attitude that we are supposed to possess, to willingly serve, to not feel compelled to do it, to where we do ecclesial functions, And we take on responsibilities because it's our job to do. And we view it as a thankless job, something that needs to be done, just like any other task in life. He says, no, you need to willingly do it. This is the attitude, not feeling compelled that this is something that we have to do. He talks about the motivation and eagerness to help others, not for selfish gain or for position. And he talks about the method, leading by example, leading from amongst the flock, and not using that position as the world uses those positions, to lord it over other people, to tell them what to do, but to lead by example is the strongest thing that Peter says to do here, leading from among the flock. And so he summarizes for them the role of what they are to do, to feed and lead the ecclesia, and the attitude of how they are to do it, to make sure that they're leading by example and willingly giving of themselves. You could see how Peter demonstrated these aspects in his own apostleship, in his own shepherding. Think about how he fed the flock yesterday in Acts chapter 2 when he went out on the day of Pentecost and he was feeding the Jews 
with those things concerning the word of life. Look at what he did for that man in Acts chapter 3, using the Spirit to heal him to where he was walking and leaping and praising God. Think about what he ended up doing as well in preaching the word in Samaria, feeding the flock of God, feeding the flock of God in the household of Cornelius in Acts chapter 10. Peter was continually feeding others, putting himself aside. What about this aspect of protection? It's Peter who's out there bearing the brunt with John of the persecution that was taking place at the hands of the religious leaders. It's Peter in Acts chapter 5 who's looking at the wolves in sheep's clothing, dealing with Ananias and Sapphira, keeping corruption away from the flock. You can see how in all of these things, Peter is leading by example, looking to his Lord to see what his Lord had done and trying to implement these things in his life. That doesn't mean that Peter was perfect, though. Because we know even in the book of Galatians that Paul references that he had to withstand Peter to his face. Because in certain cases, Peter reverted back. He refused to eat with the Gentiles when the Jews were around. But Peter was humble enough to accept that rebuke, to keep growing, to keep moving forward. But when Peter was with Jesus in his ministry, his approach was different, wasn't it? When he looked at the feeding of the 5,000, Peter was among those who said, well, The day is far spent. Send them away. Let them find food. But Jesus had told him, it's your responsibility to feed the flock. And now Peter looked at it as his responsibility to feed the flock. Early on, Peter's desire to be with Jesus overrode everything else. That he personally wanted to be with Jesus, leaving others behind. But Peter is not leaving anyone behind at this point. Peter is not saying that he's in a better position, that all the others would be offended and he wouldn't. He's linking himself to his brethren and the approach and the attitude that he's using here. Peter had now learned that in addition to feeding, that he needed to be looking out for the concerns of others. It wasn't just about him getting to the kingdom, just like it's not about us personally getting to the kingdom. It was about Peter helping his brothers and sisters get to the kingdom. Look at the people, look at the brothers and sisters that are sitting around you now. Each one of us will be going back to something different than what we're doing right now. Try to think of how we can have an impact in each other's lives to where we don't just completely go off the radar, but we stay in contact with each other. We know what's going on. We're present for each other, trying to help each other when we need help, knowing when others need help. Evidence of our conversion or lack thereof will really be shown in this area, as we've already seen, that this is the fruit of conversion, of the impact that we have in the lives of each other. Peter had made this turn in his spiritual walk, and it's worth asking ourselves the question of how effectively are we doing this today? And if you're anything like me, I'm sure it's an area where you'd say, Yeah, there's some real opportunity there for improvement. To be more purposeful in knowing and being helpful in what's going on in my brothers' and sisters' lives. Well, you can see here that Peter continues on in verse 4, where he begins to talk about the chief shepherd, the chief shepherd that shall appear. Because despite the shepherding impact that many of us will have in each other's lives and that Peter was having in their life, he reminds them, that there is one chief shepherd. There is one chief shepherd of the flock, the Lord Jesus Christ. It's Jesus Christ who has that everlasting crown of glory that he will offer to each and every one of us. And though Jesus had and continues to have preeminence, Jesus led by service, didn't he? Because when you continue to read on, you can see this element being brought out. And I think Peter's mind is thinking back to the example that he saw of the Lord Jesus Christ. He addresses the young in the flock for a moment at the beginning of verse 5, saying to the younger to submit themselves unto the elder. He speaks now not just to the sheep, but also to the lambs, to feed the lambs, instructing them. You actually need to submit to the leadership of the elders. But lest the elders begin to think, well, that's right, youngsters, listen up. He quickly adds in, Yea, all of you, 
be subject one to another and be clothed with humility. For God resists the proud and giveth grace to the humble. Just think about what Peter would have been imagining. Who had Peter seen clothed with humility? Jesus. Remember in John 13, when Jesus took on him the robes of the servant, the servant rags, and began to wash the feet of the disciples. Imagine what Jesus would have looked like after that activity, clothed with filth, the Son of God, working on behalf of his brethren, clothed with humility for those who he had came to save. But just imagine what Jesus had going on in his life. This was the night that he was going to be betrayed. Hours away was the crucifixion, a brutality that none of us will have to encounter. At least I hope that's the case. But you can see what Peter went through as he pondered these things in his mind of what Jesus endured. But despite that, think of all the excuses that Jesus could have had to be distracted, to be thinking about himself and what he would have to endure. But instead, Jesus is looking diligently to the needs of his brothers and sisters, preparing them for what lay ahead. And what is Peter doing? Peter's in jail, awaiting his own death. Not thinking about his own death, but thinking about how he can strengthen the flock of God to endure what they are going to have to endure. Do you see how Peter's learning from what his Lord had showed him? But what about us? What excuses do we make for ourselves for not being present in each other's lives? We live in an age of distraction, don't we? We can be physically present somewhere, but mentally we can be miles away. Even as we sit in this room now, we can be thinking about a whole host of other things. We all have distractionary devices that we carry around with us that we're all tethered to. And where if we get a free moment, we're updating a profile, we're sending a Snapchat, we're looking at a news feed. There's something to distract our minds. We can get home to our families at the end of the day and not be there. We cannot be there for our brothers and sisters. But Peter's saying, don't just be physically present. Be there. Be present for your brothers and sisters, for your family. Jesus was physically present. He was emotionally present. He was spiritually present when his disciples needed him, when he could be distracted with what awaited him just a few hours away. What an amazing example that Peter's referencing and the Lord Jesus Christ, thinking about esteeming others better than themselves. And Peter's talking about how a strong ecclesia plays a pivotal role in enabling the sheep and enabling the brothers and sisters to be able to press forward. But he says it's not just about a strong ecclesia. And he reminds the brothers and sisters to think about God, to think about God and what he was doing for them and to rely on God. He says in verse 7 what they needed to do, to cast all their care upon him, for he careth for you, speaking concerning God. And the ESV reads, casting all your anxieties on him, because he cares for you. How many of us experience anxiety? Probably don't need to raise our hands, because every hand in the room would likely be up. Anxiety is something that we struggle with a great deal. But what's really interesting is what Peter links anxiety to. He actually links anxiety here to pride. And we think, well, wait a minute. How does anxiety have anything to do with pride? But look at what he says in verses 6 and 7. Reading from the ESV, he says, Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so at the proper time he may exalt you, casting all your anxieties upon him, because he cares for you. Peter's saying that we're not really humble if we're not casting our anxieties upon the Lord. Because what we're doing is we're refusing to give to God something that we are unable to deal with. And because of that, we're unwilling to let go. Think about this pictorial model for a moment and consider the truth in this. In our lives, there's things that matter. 
and in our lives, there's things that we can control. There's a region of overlap between these two things, but there's also a great deal of things that are not overlapping. For example, there's things that we can control that really don't matter, that really don't move the needle in helping us to the kingdom, things that we can waste our time on. And I'm sure that we could populate a list of those things. And it's a useful exercise to do that, to go through our day, to go through our week, and to think about what are the things that I spend time on that I can control that really aren't helping me toward the kingdom. On the other hand, there's a number of things that really matter, that are really important that we just can't control. When a trial ends, somebody else's behavior, what the future ultimately holds for us in terms of what's going to happen. This is where anxiety comes from. Things that matter that we can't control. What we need to do is we need to find the overlap between those two of the things that matter and the things that we can control. To think about our relationship with God. To think about our attitude, our behavior, and the response that we have toward trial. These are all things that are within our control that God is expecting us to do something with. These are all things that matter. And Peter is telling us that we have to give our anxiety to God. We have to let it go so that we can focus on the things that matter and the things that we can control. The overlap of those two circles because we can spend a lot of time churning and never add a moment to our lives, never add a cubit to our stature, as our Lord says. But why is it important to give our anxiety to God? Well, because it enables what Peter continues to say here to the disciples. He says in verse 8, to be sober and to be vigilant. When you take a look at this word sober, it means to be calm and collected in spirit. And to be vigilant means to watch. Vigilant comes from a root word meaning to be roused out of sleep. So you think about that type of an experience. Just think about that for a moment. I'm sure we've all had it. Somebody thought it would be funny. We're sleeping. And somebody shakes us out of sleep. What's your reaction when that happens? The eyes shoot open. You start breathing deeply. You can just feel the adrenaline coursing in your body. And as you feel every heartbeat pounding in your chest... You are very, very alert, but you're anything but calm, right? So he's saying be calm and be vigilant. So Peter expects us to have this kind of alertness, to watch with this kind of intensity, but to be calm and collected in spirit. It's a very difficult mix of attributes, isn't it? We can imagine somebody being calm and complacent, kind of sitting back, not really doing much of anything not really concerned with the whole lot. Or we can imagine somebody who's very fanatical, that's constantly looking from side to side, a bundle of energy. I'm sure that we've seen a lot of little kids running around like that this week. A lot of energy that we'd love to bottle up. But how do you combine these two things? To be calm and collected in spirit, but to be vigilant, to watch with that kind of intensity. Some have coined this as a calm energy. A calm energy is something that is a state of mind where one can dispassionately focus on an end goal and methodically make real strides toward the pursuit of that end goal. This calm energy is what Peter is instructing them to have. It's what Daniel had in the face of trial, isn't it? As we were looking at in our first portion studies. It's what Daniel's three friends had of where they could stand before the king of this earth, the earthly king, and they could say, we're not going to bow down. You can do whatever you want to us, and our God will save us. And even if he doesn't, we're still not going to bow down. And where Daniel doesn't change what he did each and every day because of a decree that a king foolishly made. This is the calm energy that he's counseling them to have. But look at what it is that they're going to face. He says, your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. He personifies the Romans in the form of a lion. Yes, it has an application to sin as well, but it would have also had a real application to the Romans. Think about yourself if some lions came in that back door right now. 
Would you guys have that calm energy? Would you guys be calm and collected in the spirit? I know I wouldn't. I'd probably be hiding behind this podium here. But when you think about it, this is what he's telling them to have because this was reality for the believers at that time. That the believers at that time, in just a few short years, would have lions coming to devour them for entertainment, for the populace of Rome. But they would have to stand resolute in their faith. Peter didn't want them to fail. He wanted them to endure. This is a representation of our brothers and sisters and what they endured in the first century. This was reality for them. Death as entertainment. And Peter says, it's not the end. This is not the end of what it is that we're looking forward to. Peter needed to have this type of mindset. And not just him, for the trial that awaited him, but he needed others to have this type of mindset as well. Because the natural reaction when we feel threatened is our fight or flight reaction kicks in. The basic instinct that we've all been given, the instinct that we saw Peter exhibiting in the garden that night. But Peter's saying you can't exhibit that type of behavior because when that happens, when we allow instincts to kick in, we just react to life circumstances. It kicks out all of our training and instead we find ourselves just acting according to instinct. Peter says, take that energy and channel it into useful conduits, into actions that are purposeful. And training, training helps you to do that. Preparation allows you to do that, is what Peter's saying. And he's trying to instruct them to have this mindset going into trial. This was the mindset that he saw his Lord have as his Lord faced trial, as his Lord was being condemned being beaten, buffeted, that his Lord still had the presence of mind upon hearing the swearings and cursings of Peter to turn and look at him with a look that was absolutely critical for Peter's conversion, a look that was necessary for Peter to keep moving forward. The presence of mind that Jesus had on the cross to speak to a thief, to give him the assurance <coughs> that based on his declaration that he would be forgiven for the things that he had done wrong, a presence of mind to comfort his mother as she watched her son die on the cross. He had seen these things from his Lord, and now Peter was exhibiting them himself, and he's instructing others in verse 9 to resist steadfast in the, in the faith. This steadfastness in the faith means a stubbornness, but it's not the stubbornness that we're all experts at, which we exhibit with each other quite regularly. This is a stubbornness of remaining resolute regardless of what else is happening in our lives, of where we will not compromise. Isn't it amazing how well Scripture dovetails together of how we just heard about this in an hour-long session all week in the life of Daniel, and we're seeing it now in the words that Peter is taking as he reflects on Daniel, as he reflects on his Lord, and as he uses these things to encourage his brethren, so too we need to have this same confidence and encourage our brothers and sisters to share in this confidence as well that these things are working toward the end that we need them to work toward. It's not a matter of just surviving trial. Sometimes we think, you know, I just need this trial to end. I just need to survive it so that I can move on. It's not about surviving trial. It's about growing through trial because it's through that growth that Peter's telling us that will be converted and that transformation will actually take place. Look at verse 10 of where Peter talks about this process and he identifies what this process looks like. He says, after you have suffered a while, and this word a while is a little while, a little bit. How many of us would characterize being eaten by lions or being crucified in the case of Peter as suffering a little bit? This is where Peter's mind was at. He had completely refocused on what it was that he was working toward. And because eternity expands so vast, what he endured for this present age was a little bit, a little while. See the perspective that Peter has and the perspective that he's encouraging us to have 
about the trials that we have, no matter how largely they loom, no matter how long they seem to last, he says this life is a vapor compared to the life that is to come. He tells them that God will mend them by making them perfect. He repeats it twice. This word mend is the same thing that Peter was doing in Mark 1 and verse 19 of mending the net of when our faith gets destroyed or feels like there's holes that are ripped into it. He's giving them the assurance that God will put it back together, that God will make us whole. He says to establish, which means to make firm or harden. This is the word that Jesus said to Peter. When you're converted, strengthen your brethren. Make them firm. Make them confident. That's the expression, the mindset that Jesus had in Luke chapter 9 of when he made his face steadfast to go to Jerusalem. He hardened his face. He hardened that resolve to keep pressing forward. He said to strengthen, which means to strengthen or to make stand. And finally, he says to settle you, which means to lay the foundation, to place on a solid foundation. So making a word picture of this, think about this as it relates to the trials that we endure, the things that we go through, that Peter is preparing the believers to calmly and resolutely face trial. That even though a lion would come in the form of the Romans and attack many of them, leading to the end of their life in this present age, that this was not the end. This was not the end. But instead, he paints this picture for them. Think about this in the context of a building, of when an earthquake comes along, shakes our faith, feeling like it totally dismantles us and crumbles us to pieces. He says, God will mend you. He'll take you brick by brick and put you back together. But not just putting you back together, but he will make you firm or harden. The mortar that holds us together to make us stand. He'll strengthen us because merely putting back together the same things that were there before won't be sufficient. What God starts with is not who we are to become. And so he's rebuilding us, repurposing us, and putting new things into us to make us stronger so that we might stand. And when we stand, he puts us on a firm foundation. The same reference that's used, the same word in regards to the man that built his house on the rock. This is what God will do for us in the face of trial. Trials are a part of a building process, not a demolition process. And sometimes we can think that these trials are destroying us. But there's already something there when God begins. And so some element of dismantling is required if he's going to reshape and to reform as the hands of the potter seem to work heavy on us at times. Transformation is a part of the process. Transformation is what God is working on. Many believe that at the time of this letter, Peter was a prisoner. But Peter is looking to the needs of his brethren. Peter's learned so much from his Lord over the last 30 years and so, too, we have the same opportunity that Peter had and that Peter exhibited and that through the Spirit he's counseling us to exhibit in our lives. Just think about the things that he had learned and that we've learned as we've walked through his life together, of where he answered the call, that it takes time, but that God expects that ultimately we will make a commitment, that God calls and it's our privilege to be able to answer that call. And that when God calls us, He doesn't call us based on who we are today, but He calls us based on who we are to become. An identity change is required when we seek to follow our Lord. We continued walking with Peter to see what he learned as he tried to be a disciple, as he walked on the water and learned the need for faith, for fellowship, for prayer as he approached his, his Lord, that he couldn't do it on his own, but that he needed his brethren and he needed his heavenly Father and he needed his Lord to lift him up. And we saw that despite the failings, that his Lord would continue to work with him, continue to give him a vision of the kingdom, just as God will give us a vision of the kingdom if we continue to apply ourselves to his word. But despite all this, we saw where Peter struggled with faith and where he faced failure. And there'll be times when we face failure in our lives, when we'll let our Lord down, and when we'll realize that we've denied our Lord based on what we've done or the things that we've said, we need to make sure that in those moments of darkness, those moments of sadness, that it's not a sorrow of this world, but it's a sorrow that is godly, that works to repentance. And if we do that, then our Lord will convert us. 
that he'll help us to see the need for us to not just pursue our Lord ourselves, but to encourage others to do the same, to feed the flock, to not look back and compare ourselves to others, but to keep following our Lord, to use the opportunities to preach, to share the gospel message with others, and to learn the lessons of being a shepherd, as we've seen this morning. The cross before the crown, that these trials are necessary to help us to the kingdom and that we must focus on the kingdom during our trial. The requirements of us as shepherds, that each one of us needs to be a leader in the way that we interact with each other, that we need to feed and lead the flock of God, that we need to give our anxiety away to God because it's an enabler that allows us to truly seek the kingdom and to calmly and resolutely face trial. And we've seen with the process of trial, that trial is a building process but that some deconstruction is necessary if we are truly going to be transformed. But God will make us stand in His grace. And we have the assurance from the life of Peter, don't we? That if we want to be with Jesus more than anything else in the world, that He will transform our characters, that He will change us into the vessels that He needs us to be. Sometimes we look at individuals within Scripture and we can wonder, how could I ever attain unto that? But Peter had highs and lows, things that he did well in many areas where he needed to learn. And this lesson comes out so powerfully that if we can keep focused on the kingdom, if we can make that our point of focus and help our brothers and sisters to do the same, that we'll receive this crown of glory that will not fade away. Peter instructs us at the end of his second epistle, as we close this session, for the Bible school. He says in 2 Peter 3 and verse 18, But grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To Him be glory both now and forever. Amen. Even so, come Lord Jesus. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all.